ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello and welcome to Science Faction 37, the science faction of self-reflection. Oh. I am your host, Robert Timothy, full-time archaeologist, part-time stand-up comedian, all-time lover of science, and all things science, including my co-host, our research scientist, Miss Jackie. Jackie, how are you doing tonight? Hi, I'm good. I'm excited about today's crop of articles. I can tell that. I think there's You're some waiting good for stuff. harvest. You're, we you're harvest jumping out of your seat at this point. You know, I don't want to come early. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody likes that. Come Speaking back. of somebody who comes early, let's move on to our comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how are you doing tonight? Great. I've been uh, doing a little self-reflecting since I found out that was the theme of the show. Good. I've been for like It's been like 20 seconds, and I don't wow. like what I've seen yeah. so far. This is supposed to be therapeutic for you? It's supposed yeah. to be helpful for everybody? I don't see how traumatizing me is going to... You know what? Just encouraging you to self-reflect <laughs> traumatizes you. I need, I need my protective ego. It's going back up. I'm the greatest, and it's up. It is up. And speaking of the greatest, we're here at one of the greatest comedy clubs in the country, the Madhouse Comedy Club in downtown San Diego, California, along the skyline of San Diego. Come on out here. We're on the top of Horton Plaza. We'd love to see you. And if you don't catch us, you can at least catch some of the top touring comedians going around the country right now. Is there a cream for that? (laughs) But if you miss that, you can always catch Science Articles. From molecules to particles. This is Science Articles. All right, our first article, very interesting one, probably one of the most interesting things going on. It's blowing up all of the science websites right now because it's quite an amazing discovery. Schizophrenia or schizophrenias, it looks like the disease we've classified as schizophrenia, for those of you who are unfamiliar, mental issue, it's actually responsible for a significant amount of people you see that are homeless, that are Mm -hmm. mentally ill out there. Uh, And it's also responsible for a significant portion of the plot of A Beautiful Mind. So in case you don't know about schizophrenia, that's basically what you see when you go out and you see a homeless person on the street that's acting crazy. For the most part, that's schizophrenic. Occasionally, it'll be a bipolar or somebody else, but but the vast majority of... How about of, just lazy? How, many, yeah. how much is it just lazy? You just or get like, a jab. Or like really committed to a joke. Yeah. I mean, it's a fucking hilarious <laughs> joke. That's right. It's pretty good. Well, schizophrenia has long been studied, and, and we've noticed some interesting things. Like, they tried to find a genetic basis for it, and they thought they had a few times. They were like, look, we found these genes that are associated with schizophrenia. But then they looked in other people and they couldn't find those genes anymore. And they're like, what's going on? We know this is genetic. We don't know what's going on. Why can't we find this? So a team that published in the Journal of American Psychology did a gigantic study recently. 4,200 schizophrenics and 3,800 non-schizophrenics as a control. That's gigantic when it comes to genetic studies of this Mm -hmm. type. They looked at 700,000 single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SMPs. Snips is what we snip, call snip. them at the, at the workplace. They're atrocious to deal with. They're just like... You <laughs> snips. Could, you can only deal with them in small doses. Let me put it that way. <laughs> so they small were able to doses. sort the schizophrenic patients by symptom type and severity and compare those SMPs. They found that it wasn't one or even a small handful of genes acting independently to cause one disorder but a total of 42 genetic clusters working together that were responsible for bringing out the symptoms for not one disease, but eight separate disorders. That's fucking amazing. Imagine finding out that chickenpox was actually nine different viruses we didn't think. (laughs) They just all made chickenpox. That's what we have discovered, essentially. I would question how competent the scientists before were for not discovering that, you know... That chickenpox was nine separate viruses. I don't. I'm not, I don't work no, in the. Re- I don't work in the nine, field. But to- and what's interesting is that explains a lot of the problems of the previous scientists trying to figure it out because they would find a specific common genetic trait between a bunch of people who had schizophrenia and they'd be like, oh, we got it, we got it, and then they look at a bunch of others and be like, oh wait, no, seven out of the eight of these don't have it. Yeah. And so it turns out the issue is that there are multiple ways to make a schizophrenic, or maybe we just group a lot of things as schizophrenia when they're actually independent things. So wait, we can make, so I can make like the artist schizophrenic. That's the most coveted of all the schizophrenics, by the way, is the tortured artist schizophrenic. (laughs) So I can essentially take a gamble on my child. Like, listen, I already got a jock. Yeah. This one. You you are eight times more likely now. Listen, this kid... (laughs) This kid has no personality. I just gave him one. He now is a conversation piece. You will now not just be a desk ornament at an office somewhere. Nice. <laughs> He'll the, cut off his ear. 
The result of this study provides an incredibly clear connection between those SNPs and specific symptoms. Certain genetic variations were 95% accurate in predicting delusions and hallucinations, while other SMPs were 100% accurate in estimating speech and behavior abnormalities associated with schizophrenia. For those of you who are not familiar, in terms of genetics influencing phenotype, that's as good as it gets. There's very little that you can find. I mean, even when you look at genes for people being tall, you don't usually get 95% yeah. in phenotypic uh, expression. What, what was the degree of schizophrenia? Because presumably the, the group that was classified as schizophrenic was diagnosed. Yes. But now that the diagnosis might have eight different versions mm-hmm. of itself, you know, how did that sort of change the group? I don't know that it does because I think as far as a DSM-4 or now 5, as far as the DSM-5 is concerned, which is basically the diagnostic manual that psychologists use to diagnose these conditions, I think all of those eight still fall within schizophrenia. You know, mm-hmm. in the same sense that you could call, say somebody has a flu, whether they have one particular mm-hmm. flu virus or a different one. I was wondering if it's as broad now, well, I mean, not numerically, but like dementia, which mm. is like... No. 80 some odd different things yeah but um so i was just curious yeah maybe it's not maybe change. maybe not as broad as dementia and it will be interesting that's a major question you know are we going to start renaming this are we going to start saying yeah. people who have these type of things that we've called schizophrenia before but have very specific things this yeah, is a new name someone's syndrome yeah damien syndrome <laughs> right there are environmental factors such as drug use and emotional trauma that can contribute to the onset of schizophrenic symptoms but the disorder is attributed to genetics about 80 percent of the time How interesting is it that eight different genetic issues can manifest as one overall condition? This is amazing. Biggest news in science right now. Very, very cool story. I got some questions for my panel about this. Question number one. The ability to identify this early will revolutionize the treatment of schizophrenia dramatically, which is what we can do now that we have those genetic markers. If we do this and we have effective prevention and mitigation programs for schizophrenia, how will urban areas adapt to the severe lack of homeless people? Oh, I I think it's a big win for everybody. I mean, I as someone who has been chased not once but twice by a homeless person. Stop chased, stealing their shit. Cha- no, no, chased and harassed. I feel like I can actually walk in the street again. That's, that is a niche. Like nature abhors a vacuum. It's going to be filled by something. I mean, perhaps cockroaches, perhaps stray Ooh, dogs. Oh, I hope not. Perhaps ironic hipsters. So you, I don't know. Do you think hipsters... <laughs> I'll take more bars. That'll that would be me. interesting. What if hipsters, the new hipster thing, they're like, everybody keeps doing the same thing, going to the indie rock shows and the small coffee houses that I go to. You know what no one's doing? Because the, the homeless people left is just sleeping on the sidewalk. Yeah. They already have the beards and the weird <laughs> clothes. They just decide to lay down. All of a sudden, <laughs> hipsters transform into homeless people and we have a whole different demographic. Or what if by living on the streets and, and living in the gutters, they gentrify the gutters, and next thing you know, you know, city work projects, sidewalks, park benches, all skyrocket in value. Well, well I think what would be nice is they're all on their high horse anyway, and now they'll literally bring a soapbox around with them. Interesting. Who knows? We might see the prevention of, or at least the significant treatment of, most of schizophrenia within our lifetime. That's really interesting. That's science in action. Super exciting stuff. Science in action. Question number two. Schizophrenia is scary because not only is it severely debilitating and life-altering, but it does not manifest itself until adulthood, meaning you live your life as a completely normal person, and then somewhere around 25 or 30, though it can happen younger, you essentially just go crazy. You guys are both 30. I think. <laughs> oh my god. And I should note, more likely to happen to Jackie than Damien, because it usually is later onset in women. So Damien, statistically, would be more likely to have it happened already, while Jackie is kind of in a place where it could happen more likely to her right now. It'd be way too easy to explain away my downward spiral by schizophrenia. That's true. It would just be too simple. It really would. Also the peeing. You guys are both 30. What would you do, think, or feel if diagnosed with the early stages of schizophrenia tomorrow? I would definitely just start sort of adopting a Tourette's version of life where I say whatever the fuck I want and scream at people. Okay. Which I mean, I, know, I don't know I that know that's a really, different disease. Yeah, it is a different but, disease. But I'm sort of, I'm adapting the screaming and no filter and putting it into, okay. you know, my, my lifestyle, which I think I would enjoy. Just yelling things at people? Well, just, just telling people how I legitimately feel about their stupidity. You could do that now. 
Yeah, you don't but, need. Yeah, but I'm really. Fr- it's frowned upon. You know, yeah, like you're well, not really supposed to do that. Depends who's like, doing the frowning. Old people and schizophrenics get a pass. Yeah, well, that's yeah. right. Because nobody thinks anything bad about homeless people. Like yeah. nobody has ever walked by a homeless person. Well, I'm not gonna look gross. But they don't hold them. They don't keep them to desk. <laughs> I mean, you, a homeless person can scream like "suck my cock" at you, and you're just like, "Oh, you're adorable." Yeah. 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 You know what? Here's my number. Yeah. I don't do this often. <laughs> I mean, it's not like he's gonna get fired. And you know what? Don't clean it. I want the authentic homeless cocksucking experience. <laughs> oh, you're self-employed. Is that all those cans I see? <laughs> Damien, what would you do if you found out tomorrow you had the genetic markers for schizophrenia? I think from this point forward, from 30 onwards, yeah. I would question every attractive girl I met in a bar. And if I took home and slept like there, like, did I just imagine this? And so really, you know, and, and she'd be my perfect woman. Okay. Like in every so, way. So after you question both of them. Yes. After I... <laughs> Then what do you do with the rest of your life? Well, it's from here on. So, like, you're right. There's, there's going Join to be, me. There is going to be a, a band of very unattractive. There's going to be uh, how many? Well, I mean, I'm guessing that, that the schizophrenia like- would also, like we talked about, put you in a lower socioeconomic class and then also mean you would probably get slightly worse tail. I'm talking like I think I land like the 33-year-old stripper who's just gotten out of the game because, you know, she has two kids that she's a terrible mother to, like, but she could still keep it together because that's her focus. <laughs> and she doesn't where- get fat because of the meth. Yeah. And so, like, right. you can imagine what a what a pain in the ass she would be mm-hmm. and just how insane she would be. So it would be really hard to discover if I was schizophrenic or not because I'm around people. I wouldn't know if they're if they're looking at me because I'm having an imaginary conversation with an imaginary person yeah. or if I'm having a conversation with an insane person. <laughs> so, Ooh, yeah. D- Damien's life would be like a real-life version of Shallow Hell where, like, you have this like, total fantasy world. It sounds wonderful. It would be like the Satanist version of Shallow Hell. I agree. Instead of like a heartwarming story that teaches right, you to look yeah. past beauty, it's a... It's a <laughs> Embrace meth. Yeah, I got you. And it's ironic you say that because both Jason Alexander and Tony Robbins have done a bunch to fuck up Damien's life. <laughs> they hate him. I don't know why. Be careful who you snub, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Question number three. If a cure is discovered, what possible downsides would schizophrenics face from no longer being schizophrenics? We're thinking about plus sides, right? You yeah. know, not peeing on yourself and then getting a job and not being crazy. No. What are the downsides? Uh, what are you going to do with all that extra tinfoil? <laughs> no more hats? I mean... You're gonna, you, can't, you can only you steam have, so many veggies, you okay? Have years of food preservation in the closet. Yeah. Okay, I like that. What about you, David? I would imagine that anybody with schizophrenia is a real pain in the ass for everybody else to hang around with. But mm, like their yeah. big selling point is, I'm interesting. I keep things interesting. All of a sudden, they so lose that. About you. Oh. Now they're fucking boring. Dude's, <laughs> dude is wearing a turtleneck and a blazer, and he just talks about the TV show he saw last night. Mm. Do you like the Big Bang Theory? <laughs> Best show since Becker. Oh, God. Hey. I got some coins I've been collecting. Man, on to our next story. This one I love. This is great because this is this is not only science and action. This is watching this specific show yeah. go national. I thought this was like your thesis. This is something Damien and I have been talking about since we were 12 years old. We had a dream as early scientists yeah. who got their balls kicked a lot. Listen, <laughs> Damien and I grew up, you know the movie Lord of the Flies? Mm, yeah. Imagine that, but take out the island and the murder and all that stuff and replace it with dudes who just consistently kicked each other in the balls. I would prefer the island with the murder. Way better. Way oh. better. <laughs> like, at least it's over. It's not like, at least, you don't have to get like three yeah, kicked in the balls th- your back. three times in an hour. And I think at one of these points when I was vomiting in a trash can, I came to the realization that women complain about childbirth too much. Because when we, you were 12, women complained yes, about childbirth yes. too much? We grew up 15 minutes from Mexico. You got That's to, right. Yeah. Half our friends were pregnant. I was like, this happens to me all the time. I get kicked in the balls at least daily. At least. At least. And it's unsuspecting. You know, you guys have nine months of preparation and an epidural for your pregnancy. I get kicked in the balls on a daily basis. It's a pain you cannot imagine. No women can imagine getting kicked in the balls. The closest I can compare it to is getting jabbed in the eye as hard as somebody can. Mm -hmm. That thing where your eye hurts worse after the injury than, you know, for the next 10 minutes, you're like, ah. Yeah. You know, when you get jabbed in the eye that hard, you don't have tons of pain receptors, like real deep. So it's like, you can imagine how much actual damage was done to your eye when compared to your testicles, which are designed to take some damage. Uh, Yeah. Well, I think they're designed to pull up. We made it, and I actually had a stand-up bit about this that I'd done a few times about, you know, men having more pain throughout a lifetime getting kicked in the balls than women statistically two to three times giving birth most of the time with an epidural. But are we talking hourly? Because labor goes on for... Sometimes, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I'm talking hours, about overtime. Yeah, ball pain goes on for a minimum of 10 minutes. 
You're saying daily? I hit that in a month. Yeah, like, okay. especially okay. in That's what I'm asking. I, and I, I, it happened to us as children. Yeah. As ch- innocent children. It didn't happen to you, Damien. You perpetrated it with not Bobby only so, in not your always, living room. No, first of all, there was some a, kind of fun, it wasn't, a fun house. It wasn't like an agreement. It, it's <laughs> like the way crime works in the ghetto. You know, like one guy gets a gun, the other guy needs to get a gun. Yeah. <laughs> Essentially, you're not. I, but I'm it not also wasn't the guilt. Let me let me put this in real. street terms. If I kill Bobby's homie, yeah, Bobby's coming back to kill one of my homies. Yeah, oh, okay? I get that. Not just that. It doesn't just happen from purposeful events of your friend hitting you. You hit the brakes too hard on your bike and go forward into that bar that's in the middle, and you're in bed for the next twenty minutes. <laughs> but we <laughs> easily. Thing is, it happens Utopia. on it happens on accident. It happens on purpose. It happens randomly. You could be walking, just like walking someplace, and accidentally take the wrong turn into a short pole and get your balls hit. It's mm-hmm. excruciating. It's a common weakness and you're always vulnerable to it. No matter what, any fight, some dude can just kick you in the nuts and you're done. Not to mention as you get older, th- while you play less sports, the threat of sitting on your balls goes up tenfold. Way bigger. Way bigger. Once the balls Fair. start getting some stretch to Fair. them. That's, so that's I, my best argument for the kilt. Completely yeah. prevents that. <laughs> I've always said, and Damien has backed me up, that I think it's worse to be a dude pain-wise. The ball pain adds up way more than the childbirth. Give me an epidural every time I have a ball pain, and then you can start claiming that it's the same. It's the difference between getting a, the lump sum for the lotto yeah. or getting the monthly installment. Yeah, but, exactly. But, it, oh. Can I just say that I think it's the, I think it's the time you, that you don't get the epidural that they're making the comparison, not sure. when you get the epidural. But that's so rare. Right now, the vast majority of have at least some significant painkillers, if not a complete epidural. Uh-huh. Okay. Furthermore, women in third world countries aren't huge pussies. <laughs> They go That's on true. to plow the field once yeah. they're done. Yeah, the, the the women in Southeast Asia, they pop the baby out and they keep picking the rice. That's the okay. old motto, right? Okay, so uh, we've joked about this forever, and I just thought this was an inside joke, something that we talked about. I was on I Fucking Love Science the other day, and I see a video from this. By the way, I have to admit, I, there was a company I didn't know about called ASAP Science. Yeah. I hadn't heard of them before. They make uh, online science videos. They are fan-fucking-tastic. Go videos. check them out. I, I'm, I'm sad and ashamed that I hadn't seen them before because they are great. But uh, they a, did a video on this exact topic, which I assume they stole from us. <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> they broke it down in, in an interesting way. They looked at how pain was felt through uh, nociceptors. And how the testes are full of these nociceptors and that pain basically gets connected. Those nociceptors connect directly from the balls to the stomach, which is why if you talk to men, they feel the pain a lot in their stomach. It's Mm -hmm. an incredible pain in your stomach. And also to the vomit centers, which explains a frequent occurrence that Damien and I discovered in middle school, which is (laughs) if you really hit a home run... If you knock it out of the park, the other dude's going to start throwing up. <laughs> Did you get like uh, like points? I mean, oh, it's, it's rare. That's, that's it's just it's incredibly much. rare to be able to pull that off. I think it's happened to me twice in my life. Don't don't think of it like the way a boxer. He rarely wins by KO. Yeah. Like okay. he rarely actually knocks the guy out. But when he does, uh-huh. I would say it's even right. less than that right. because the ball hitting was almost a daily occurrence. Boxers knock people out more often than that. I would say it's that that rare time when a boxer accidentally kills a guy in the ring. He wasn't trying to do that. By yeah, hit- he was trying to win. By he didn't want to go that far. You feel sorry when you see that dude throwing up in the trash can. Like, but he does it by hitting him in the balls, right? Yeah. And exactly. forever people look at you with like as a mythical figure, like, holy shit, that guy killed a man in the ring. Yeah. That guy made Bobby throw up in a trash can. Yeah. Stay the fuck away. So it's very, very, very interesting. They looked at that. They looked at these nociceptors that plug into the stomach, the vomit center. But it turns out that the mechanical distension of the uterine area also triggers nociceptors. So women also experience some of this during childbirth. See, we have balls. That's true. You do. (laughs) And it's hard to objectively measure pain. Not only do, do we not know what your experience would be compared to mine for the exact same stimulus, but other factors change the way you feel pain as an individual. You will feel pain differently at different times of the day. You'll feel it depending on what air environment you're in. So there's a lot of variation. They looked at that. They also looked at the fact that you can feel pain from no stimulus. So there's something called phantom limb pain where you lose an arm. And because you're not getting... it comes getting, back as a ghost and yeah. it like causes pain. <laughs> That's right. It chokes you in your sleep. That's how David Carradine died. They, uh, no, so if you lose a limb, what happens is you don't get these kind of nerve signals that come back to you. And, and not only do you not get the nerve signals that you, you let you control your arm and, and feel pain because it's not there, you don't get the ones that kind of your body sends as a relay signal back to see what's going on. And because of that, you experience pain in that arm that's not there. You feel as if there's pain coming through. So pain can be so subjective that you can feel intense pain with no stimulus no whatsoever. Stimulus, yeah. So it's really hard to compare. And their total at the end of this was, realistically, it's a tie. 
And I know that sounds like a cop out, but I really do suggest everyone go and watch this video. It teaches you a lot about pain, a lot about pain perception. It's very well done. Mm -hmm. And you probably link to a bunch of their other videos, which are also very, very well done. Couple of questions. <laughs> Does it link to a video of you and Damien kicking each other in the balls? Oh, please. That's, that would be and then awesome. giving birth to children to see. Yeah, yeah, that would be awesome. This is easy. <laughs> like Junior. Yeah, which one yeah. of you is Danny DeVito? Well, uh, okay, so a couple of questions for my audience. This makes sense to have these nociceptors in the testes. It makes sense that, you know, natural selection would program a human being to feel pain if they got hit in their balls because after all these are reproductive organs, you know? Mm -hmm. We need to protect them. If we had balls that didn't feel anything, we would be just using them to open rock, like just fucking slamming them on the counter for <laughs> things. Tea bags would be much highly more highly impractical. No, absolutely. Sorry. You remember in the old times when a guy would have one of those little blackjacks that he would come up behind you with and hit you in the back of the head? We'd be doing that. <laughs> like the, there would be ball utilization to the extreme if you didn't feel anything. Yeah, that's right. Because like when you teabag somebody now, it's a very delicate maneuver. It's like fueling a plane midair, yeah. right? Whereas like, could you imagine <laughs> if you're like a plane shooting another one out of the sky if there was no pain receptors? So that makes sense to me. That totally mm -hmm. makes sense. But why in the world would women have them for those uterine contractions? That seems insane. Natural selection seems to me would program a woman to not have pain when they had kids. It would want them to pop out a bunch of kids. Uh, why in the world do we have those? Damien? It's a natural defense against white trash. What? what? <laughs> Can you imagine how many more kids they would have if, like, it was just like as easy as like popping skittles? I, no. thought, I thought the nine months latency was our, our only. By the case. way, I would like to comment to everybody that Damien had originally had that joke as Mexicans, but I told him it was politically incorrect, so we went to white as trash. A, as a Mexican, how dare you, sir? Yeah. <laughs> it's offensive. As a mestizo, I'm offended. So, Damien, I'm allowed to make those. Your jokes. theory is that natural selection actually doesn't want people to breed a whole bunch, and therefore it would come up with a design that would allow for a woman to feel an incredible amount of pain when she gives birth. Yeah, and plus, like, it's not it's not the cure all. Like, for example, we get a fever to help save us during sickness. It doesn't work all the time. Yeah. You know, like like this is just one device. Yeah, but that's the thing. Nature didn't count us inventing whiskey or methamphetamine. <laughs> okay. Well, but wait a minute. I mean, we're also talking about reproductive organs in the females as well. And you still need to be able to perceive pain because a perception of pain is one way that a mother can infer that something is wrong with the baby. Do you think that, that kind of, those kind of receptors would tell them that something is wrong? Aren't those just basically for uterine contractions? They're saying man... No, no because a, nocicep a nociceptor is, for all intents and purposes, a different style of nerve. But they're yeah. alongside the same nerves that are going to tell you to contract, that are going to tell you to, to expand. And so they're in the same places. But pain is the way that your body and, and your brain thinks that something is wrong. What would it tell you it's wrong? So it's not for labor necessarily, but for all of the other time that you're harboring a fetus, if there's pain, then that is a signal to you that there could be something wrong with but the you baby. Could, but in a natural setting, you couldn't do anything about that. Uh, there are species that could, can do things about that, like the cow, for example. Extreme uterine pain can signal to the brain we need to abort, and it will self-abort, thinking there's something wrong with Cows that. have yes. abortion clinics. I don't know if you know, The Far Side was actually a documentary. <laughs> yeah, but right, they exactly. whitewashed it. They did like a 1950s version. But, they didn't have all the cow politics. But yeah, plus Gary people. Larson really wasn't talented at drying cow vaginas. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, there, there are reasons that you should be able to feel pain. I just, okay, but, I but just, how, come when, how come when I watch another mammal give birth, we would never know that they felt pain during childbirth, but it's... Whenever you watch a human female give, uh -huh. do they just not have those pain receptors? Do they just handle it better? <laughs> well, I know it's mu it's, be, it, it is it is genetic, much or... different for humans, right. very very different, very and it has different. to do with bipedalism. Exactly. So we walk upright, which makes our pelvis... what does riding a double decker bike have to do with any of this, Bobby? <laughs> We have a pelvis that's very narrow to allow us to keep our knees underneath our hips, mm -hmm. which is very important for being able to walk uh, upright. And in order to do that, in order for our spine to be where it is and everything else, there had to be a lot of changes in the human physiology, and those changes made birth much more difficult. Have and you so seen the size of a kiwi egg? And have you seen the size of a kiwi? I just think there could be legit reasons for experiencing pain down there. I'm not saying they're better than yours, guys. It just seems no, weird. No, it, it seems, seems it, it, it does not. Pleasant. It seems more counterproductive than but you're productive. Also ripping apart your insides. I mean, that's going to hurt anyway. But it's, yeah, and it's an extreme. Muscle but why attraction. would you need special it's like a extreme cramp? Yeah, why would you need special extra? Like, I understand why you need special extra nerves in the in the nuts. It's to make sure you don't use them up as but, a fucking speed bag by the time you're 17. <laughs> 
I don't understand why you need that in the I universe. I don't know that that's the only reason. That's literally the I only reason. I don't know that that's true. <laughs> that's the only reason. Question number two. Make the case for why you believe your gender has it worse and why. I said this to the guys. I don't actually think my gender has it worse. I think we have it the same as the video implies. <laughs> Jackie goes for Ty. We have it worse because in an environment where physical pain flows freely, verbal pain also flows freely. <laughs> Men are so mean to each other because once you've hit the nuclear bomb with the testicles, everything yeah. else is downhill. Like, mm-hmm. so like verbally calling somebody fat a thousand times or bragging that you, you fucked know, his mom. I got, I got to say, Damien, I am with you. I actually do think, as our long-term joke has implied, that men take more pain over a lifetime with nut pain. I got to say, I disagree with you on the being meaner part. I think women can be much meaner to each other than men. If dudes have an argument, it usually just comes down to fisticuffs. It's settled, and then it's done. Or women will torture each balls. other for decades. Like, they will... Yeah, women who are so, mean, or is it... Women who are supposedly addictive. friends. Like, the, the worst enemies you'll ever meet is two female best friends. Like, they can be... They can hate each other so much, and they do such horrible things to one another. It's because we're so upset we don't experience as much pain as you. We're trying to... <laughs> Bulk up. Okay? You just need to feel something. I'm trying to bulk up. I would argue that if you just walked up and called her a motherfucker every day just as her name for like a month and just like really just tore each other down but learned to laugh at it. I think that girls do that. It's they, only when they're truly mad that yeah. they really want to get uh, down to the But business. if you're say, I, I would say this. Throughout a man's lifetime, I think he experiences more physical pain. Throughout their lifetime, I think women experience much more of that emotional pain as far as a friend being mean to them, mm-hmm. especially when they're younger. Oh, Teenage girls definitely. can be some of the worst people to each other on the face of the earth. Oh, absolutely. Plus, yeah. you know, childbirth can kill us, so yeah. <laughs> that's pretty bad. Yeah, that's true. Childbirth can kill you, but it almost never does anymore, which has got to be super disappointing for those guys who were just <laughs> hoping that they wouldn't have to file the divorce paperwork. They're like, well... I knocked her up, you know. <laughs> I got waited out. Yeah, if it was the 1800s, they're like, I got a, I got a one in three chance that I'm not going to have to deal with this bitch come spring. And it makes the guy who dies, like in the advent of modern medicine, who dies from a when a cow kicks him in the testicles. Yeah, and the doctor could just do nothing. Like, wait, wait, child That's birth? How cows do abortions, Damien. <laughs> They kick a farmer in the testicles, you. and he just like, oh, he just grabs a coat. Oh, I'm grabbing a coat hanger. I'll be right back, motherfucker. You don't kick me. Don't you fucking move. <laughs> don't you fucking move. <laughs> Question number three. Pain is often somewhat subjective, like we talked about, that can depend on the time of day, your mood, your hormones, your current activity, and a host of other factors, all affecting your perception of that pain. What overlooked factor do you think we should investigate as being another major factor in pain perception? Uh, which episode of The Real Housewives was on earlier? So oh, that okay. Rev me up. Okay, so if you are watching a horrible, crappy TV that you shouldn't mm-hmm. watch as an educated, which adult, I enjoy quite a bit, I understand that that's <laughs> something you shouldn't brag about or admit to people publicly. I'm just honest. to be fair on the list of shows she watches, that's actually on the more respectable side. <laughs> I, Shut up. Honestly, you saying watching one of those Real Housewives shows that to me, just so you know, mm. and I don't want to offend you, mm. but that would be the equivalent of Damien walked in right now and was just telling me about how much he beat his wife. Like that would to me, that is the same type of person. I'm okay with that. Okay. Okay. But like, but like, you say it like in a way that's proud, and you're defending Go it. Go Ravens! Like... <laughs> what overlooked factor do you think we should investigate as being another major factor in pain? Religion. Okay. So actually, that's, that's probably true. Guilt. You know, no, that's that's definitely true. I bet, I bet somebody in the throes of a religious experience would probably not have as much pain perception. Or you could, if you've ever, like, you know, were the team trainer for a Jewish high school's basketball team Mm -hmm. or, like, wrestling team, I imagine, you know, like, it'd be a lot different than being, you know, at um, any other high school's wrestling team or basketball (laughs) team. Mm -hmm. A lot of taped ankles for everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And plus, a lot it, of water breaks. Yeah, and if you're like a allergy breaks, and if you're like a young Catholic male, you get taught about pain real early from the priest. So. Oh yeah, yeah. Listen, this is a deep. This is this is the way your soul feels when it's raped. <laughs> this is original sin. All right, on to our third article: Death Valley rocks. Death Valley, California, guys, is one of the hottest places on Earth, and it's also the site of a great scientific mystery. On the flat, dry lake bed of Death Valley, large boulders move across the desert floor all on their own with no explanation. It's been going on for years. Nobody has ever figured out how the fuck this is going on. Now, you can go there and you can see that a giant boulder has moved. It's gone from one place to another and you can see the trail it took. There's no footprints around, no indication of how this would happen. And people have been, scientists especially, have been postulating forever. How does this happen? Is it earthquakes? Are there animals? 
Aliens. Definitely. <laughs> Who's moving Ancient these rocks? Aliens. Nobody had ever seen it until now. And uh, what a team did, they were really smart. They're just like, listen, this is dedication. This is obviously going very slowly. We got to do some some fucking gritty science. We got to put our nose to the grindstone. So they fitted a bunch of these. Nose to the boulder. Yeah. They fitted a lot of these boulders with very sensitive GPS equipment. And then they also had time-lapse photography filming the rest of the valley. So that as soon as they were notified that these boulders were slightly moving, they could see what was going on. And they discovered what it was. It was very, very interesting. Anybody want to take a take a stab at what it might be? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm still fixed on like the grant they're writing to like convince someone to give them money for yeah. time-lapse photography of rocks. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's right. We expect <laughs> these rocks to move. Yeah. It, I think Keebler elves. Yeah, close. Okay. I think this particular part of Death Valley is a phantom live graveyard. Oh, so all the phantom limbs that people are feeling are going out there and pushing rocks around. That's probably why it's so sore later. Those people are feeling the pain. Totally. It's heavy rocks. Totally yeah, the this. ghost of severed limbs push around You know rocks. what? I might have to double check. That might be a that contributing be, factor. Yeah. Um, it turns out there's a very interesting way that this happens. Every once in a while in the winter, Death Valley gets a little bit of moisture. So a little bit of water comes on this dry lake bed. It gets very cold at night during the winter. That water freezes. How cold? Ice cold? <laughs> All right, all right, all right. All right, now, Bobby. Bobby. Yeah. Break this thing down in just a second. Now, don't break it down for nothing. We're your neighbors. Give me some sugar. I'm just curious how long this is going to go. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. All right, right, now, Jackie. All right. All right, so the water freezes, and then Death Valley has these very strong winds. Well, these long, flat, wide chunks of ice float on the top of this small little layer of water. They become giant sails for all this wind. The wind pushes them around, and then if you look at the surface area, they're really big. They, they attract a lot of the wind. They have enough surface area and enough mass to then push the rocks as they're floating on this tiny little layer of water. Then daylight comes out, as happens in Death Valley. All this water evaporates. The ice melts. The water evaporates. goes away. That day, you have no evidence of all of that going on. All you have is these rocks that have mysteriously moved. Science figured it out. Fuck yeah, science. Fuck yeah, science. Solve that mystery. Science uh, discovered filming things was a good way of discovering what happened. <laughs> science won big mysteries science. zero. No, it was, it's a big deal to do all that because even if you had time-lapse photography, if you didn't have the GPS marking when it was going on, right. it wouldn't matter. Unless you were taking video nonstop, it wouldn't matter. Oh. And so even the time-lapse wouldn't have gotten it to you without a sophisticated GPS system and monitoring programs. A couple of questions for my panel. Question number one. This is a very cool example of innovative thinking and hard work figuring out a scientific mystery. What is the next scientific mystery that will be figured out, and how? I hope it's like the Loch Ness Monster, that it exists, and they prove it, and we get to watch video of it under the sea. Okay. Loch Ness Monster, total fake. The guy who made it admitted that it was fake. Obviously, you couldn't have a please you no, and that like kind of No, it's like Houdini. He's, now they're saying it's fake, but it's actually real. Oh, I see. So that people don't catch on that it's real. I heard that it voted for independence. <laughs> it didn't want anything to do with that Union Jack no more. Good luck surviving without the pound. <laughs> Damien, what about you? What do you think the next scientific mystery will be that will be figured out, and how? I think we're going to discover cloaking technology. But when we do that, that's where we're going to discover where all the Bigfoots were. Uh, they, wait, now, now by cloaking technology, cloakers. you're talking about like Star Trek cloaks that make you invisible. They have been working on that. The military has some very yeah, yeah. interesting or cloaking. Or even magical the wearable Potter. cloaks that would... Okay. Make sure. you invisible, like Harry Potter esque. Yeah. Science is working on. The but French, you're not referring to a... simply wearing a cloak. No, no, no. I'm talking about like like think of the predator. Okay. Cloaking technology like the That's predator. That's where all the Bigfoots have been. What, That's it, why we haven't found them. What about their bones? Their bones would come uncloaked when their power supply went away. No, no, they bury them in their cloaking mask okay. oh it's like a shroud but you would come when you dug you would still hit the physical object that's invisible in front of you it's powered it's invisible. by invisible. terrible smell do? and so <laughs> that's why it's called the skunk ape <laughs> <laughs> question number two i'm so, glad they finally figured it out what do you think some of the lesser known rejected theories were that there's a team of religious fanatics that go out into the desert and just constantly recreate the scene of you shall not pass and they hit the ground so hard that the boulders just wait they're religious slightly. fanatics that are really into lord of the rings no that's from uh moses 
right? No, that's the parting that's Gandalf. That's Lord, that's Lord of the Rings. That's <laughs> no, no. What are we he thinking was, of? Matt, you're thinking of Gandalf that. trying to stop the dragon you... from chasing Frodo. That's the you shall not pass. <laughs> Why am I picturing like, Moses parted the Red Seas? He did not say a J.R.R. token line as he did it. <laughs> Let my people go. <laughs> Maybe that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> You know, it's funny that you brought that up because actually, as somebody who's done a bunch of work in the desert, the religious fanatics do go out there and make a bunch of crazy shrines. Like we find giant crosses and and like stuff like that. They totally destroy a bunch of patches of the desert. Now I'm sure they're not trying to. Yeah. They oftentimes work in archaeological sites without realizing it and destroy uh-huh. a bunch of stuff. So if you guys find yourself out in the desert, do me a favor. Don't go off roading and don't go just start moving rocks around. <laughs> you might be fucking some shit up. Damien, what do you think? I think that those rocks are the only telekinetic substance on earth and so i'll tell you what's even more interesting than the discovery of telekinesis is the discovery that rocks have minds <laughs> where are these minds based do i mean they don't have a brain you've never been to a rock mine pocahontas said everything has a mind and feelings well that's good enough for me on to the lightning round <laughs> If you've never heard the lightning round before, I ask my panelists a series of one to two sentence questions. They answer with one to two sentence responses about recent scientific articles. Are you guys ready to play? I'm ready to play. Yeah, I'll handle her. All right, lightning okay. round. Question one. What have scientists discovered the first of? A uh, legitimate excuse for not calling a woman back. <laughs> well, mm, there's a lot of those. Mm, legitimate <laughs> yeah. excuse. I yeah. wasn't attracted to her. Or See, we already legitimate. banged. Like, there's... <laughs> There's a bunch of legitimate excuses. Mm. She's my mom. <laughs> Damien, what have scientists discovered the first of? Scientists discovered their first taste of sex appeal. What was it? When the- scientists across the world are the new supermodels, and they're the sexy ones. Just a bunch of lab coats on the runway? So yeah, like essentially it's, you know, think of Stephen Hawking making it rain in a champagne room. I don't think he can physically do that. Maybe they could put an attachment on yeah. him. They'd use like an old Vegas card shuffler, <laughs> bring it up to his wheelchair, like spits one, spits the time. ones out. He has a grad student do it. <laughs> All right. In the actual answer, scientists uh, unveiled what appears to be the first truly semi-aquatic dinosaur called Spinosaurus. New fossils suggest the massive Cretaceous area predator had a life basically adapted for the oceans. The first one we found like this some ninety-five Things are million years ago. To see. Yeah. Uh, providing the most compelling evidence to date for a dinosaur to be able to live and hunt in aquatic environments. By the way, some of you might be thinking, you guys just talked about Nessie. Those plesiosaurs weren't those aquatic dinosaurs. Mm. Not really. Those were actually large aquatic reptiles, and there is a difference. Dinosaurs weren't quite reptiles. So it is real. Spinosaurus? Yes. Nessie? Yes. All right. <laughs> Question number two. What was found to have a positive effect on a male student's performance? <laughs> Viagra? I meant in school, but yes. Oh, well, you didn't say in school. <laughs> I just mentioned student for no reason. <laughs> Never being alone with the priest in Catholic school. <laughs> that would God, help your school performance. That's probably true. <laughs> that's actually probably true. The actual answer, physical activity. Uh, a Finnish study showed that higher... A- ac- so jerking off. A Finnish study showed that higher levels of physical activity are related to better academic achievement during the first three years of school, particularly in boys... It helps with better reading skills, and that participation in organized sports was linked to higher arithmetic skills and test scores in first through third grade. Hmm. Particularly, boys with high levels of physical activity, and especially walking and bicycling to and from school, had much better grades and a much better turnout later on. Why um, are jocks so dumb? They had better reading skills and uh, a couple other things. Now, that's a good question. I, I was actually thinking of this question myself, and I think it has to do with the fact of where this was done. This hmm. was this was done Finland. in Europe. Yeah, Northern Europe. Sports take on a very different meaning there. You know, sports are yeah. something you do to go have fun. In America, we try and make sports everything. We let mm-hmm. a, a kid essentially like skate through school. Yeah. Kids are allowed to skip classes. They leave school early to go to their sporting events. They Until get... very recently, you could strike a woman full force. Yeah. <laughs> you can go to college without being literate in this country. You can go to a good college without being literate in sure. this country if you can play football. And so I and think. And you're on my fantasy team. Yeah. So I think that that is a different attitude toward things. But I think what they're saying is, especially with young boys who are ramped up, you got to tire them out a bit. You got to kind of wear them down before you can sit them in a classroom because otherwise they're going to be so amped with energy. That's what the priest You can't said. teach to them. <laughs> Just tiring them out, guys. 
Um, in girls, there were a few associations, but not nearly as strong. And mm-hmm. I think that's probably you know less energy, less testosterone, less of that. I got to get out of here yeah, type absolutely. feeling. But I do find this funny as a very funny study, uh, simply from the fact that. I was probably the least physically active child in school and most academically successful, so I'm not sure how it quite worked out with me. Uh, Question number... That's not true. I just showed uh, Bobby and Damien a picture of Bobby in fifth grade working on the yearbook with some ladies. Which was literally the most physical activity I'd I'd had at that point in my life. the books. Bobby was lucky enough to have his father play the world's greatest practical joke on him. He basically convinced him in like middle school that getting good grades will get you laid. Oh, it wasn't middle school. I was getting good grades in the first grade, son. I knew where I was going. Your dad, you know, knocks on your door in kindergarten, opens up, brings in a Playboy. These are women. These are breasts. Learn to love them. That's why Bobby groped me when we were in second grade in honors class. And apparently I had an old Jewish New York dad. All right, on to question number three. What did scientists recently discover about Europeans? That they don't actually hate ice. But somebody said you can't put it in the drinks over there, and everybody just went along with it. It is a weird cultural difference, right? The it's warm so drinks. It's gross. You get used to it after a while, but the warm, like the warm beer, is kind of weird. The warm beer and the warm soda to me is offensive. Uh, yeah, Damien, that they speak English funny. <laughs> 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 Certainly true, they do. No, this is great because we actually talked about a recent study uh, just a few weeks ago that was along similar lines. They discovered that another major group contributed genetic information. If you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about the fact that you had around 7,000 years ago, 8,000 years ago, hunter-gatherers in most of Europe were running around doing their thing. And then a bunch of Middle Easterners with farming technology showed up in Southern Europe and made their way through Europe genetically interbred. And those are modern Europeans, a mixture between native European hunter-gatherers and Middle Eastern farmers. We found a whole nother genetic component that came in that that applied to most uh, Europeans, though not all, and was certainly after the Middle Eastern farmers came in. And these are ancient northern Eurasians who contributed genetic material to almost all present-day Europeans. It's Uranus, Bobby. Ah. And the research revealed an even older lineage, the Basal Eurasians, which is actually one of the first splits of humanity probably 100,000 years ago. Very, very cool. The Pestonians. I know what you're talking about. And that'll lead us right into Finish My Story. Finish My Story, where one of us has to complete the other's balls. Okay, for those of you who haven't heard the show before, Finish My Story is when our research scientist, Jackie, presents us with the beginning of a scientific article or story, and myself and Damien compete to see who can finish it the best. Damien, are you ready to play? You're going down, Timothy. You are going down. I'm beating you by two, as I remember. Ooh. Let's do it. All right. A study released in the Journal of Neurology revealed that one out of seven people experience a frequent phenomenon called confusional arousal. What do you guys think confusional arousal is, and can you give me an example that best explains your answer? I think we should let Damien go first. I, oh, you okay. So I for my one answer. Oh, because he complains about the thing. If I go first and then he copies my answer and I have to go again, he says I get more than one answer. So, right. so if I this will make you fair. happy, if for this the will last make like you ten episodes, you have found clever loopholes <laughs> to get more than one answer in. If this makes you happy, then yeah. I will let you do it. Okay, thank you, baby. Your bottle. Go ahead. Proceed. Start sucking. You can talk down about me Rosa Parksing myself, yeah. but I won't. Uh, confusional arousal is a uh, delusional psychological condition where one explains away shameful erections. Okay. <laughs> For example, mm-hmm. you walk into the bathroom, you see your father, you notice having an erection. Mm. Well, you've delusioned something out of it. Like, oh, no, I was just remembering the super hot sex I was having, you know, <laughs> yeah. with my girlfriend earlier. Uh, yeah. And or, do you also have an erection or just the dad? Did he see me? <laughs> Are you saying that he might have left that door akimbo, saying, slightly akimbo, yeah. just with a come hither look? I didn't see it. There's a slight turn, and you both have the same erection. Yeah, he was playing "Take My Breath Away" and you know, on his <laughs> on his '80s radio in there. At one point, you guys lock eyes, and he goes, "I'm no longer confused." <laughs> And then he, you know, he locks eyes. Then he just kind of motions down, like, like, what are you doing? Look down at the goods. Mm. You know, you buying meat or not? This is a butcher <laughs> shop. Okay. Didn't take it out for air. All right, okay, uh, Davey, is that like your that. answer? Are you done? Am I allowed to give I my one answer so. yet? Yes, you're good. Okay, okay. your one answer. Okay. All right, all right, Jackie, Mr. Uh, Timothy. I will tell you, my one answer was going to be that confusional arousal is when an Alzheimer's dude gets hard. <laughs> But then I remember that that would be insulting to a lot of the Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's community. And uh-huh. so I was like, I don't want to make that my answer. That's, Instead, that's... I want to move to a little bit more neutral answer. So I, I kind of modified it a little bit. And I went with 
what I call it when someone notices my erection at an elementary school play. Okay. Because that is confusional to everybody else. However, yeah. as I no, settled well, on that really, answer, I realized... He's settling on it. Hold on, hold on. Let me go. That was going to be my answer, right? Except, well, you're settling on that answer. Yeah, no, true. I was going to. But then that brings up the same pedophilic comments that Damien had talked about before. I don't want to be stepping on his toes oh, the same right. way he stepped on mine. I don't want to do what he you did. Want I don't want to be a Damien. Yeah, yeah, yeah I don't want, want to be a Damien. Okay. Do I get to go again? Like no, the, like, no so he then, doesn't want to. He doesn't want to do what you've been doing. I, I hate so then I thought of something that I could time. use to describe. Like, what would I, I if I don't know what it is? What would I use to describe confusional mm. arousal? Like, what is it? And I can say for sure it's a better option than confrontational arousal, <laughs> which I think can do like, a lot more damage. Is that like hate sex? <laughs> no, that's just like when you show up angry with an erection right up to somebody who's never met you before, and it's it's, a power it's, move. it's incredibly it's intimidating. Power move. It's super power move. Steve Jobs used to start all of his board meetings like that yeah uh damien i'm giving my one answer right now can you shut the fuck up um oh, but then uh, okay. but okay. then after but that, that's not a host. thing i'm not telling you what the thing is i'm telling you a quality of that thing which is that it's a better option than confrontation that doesn't tell you what it is right you know? yeah i want to know what it is what it is i think is a genre of film that david lynch works in oh, absolutely fucking absolutely you don't know what's going on but you're hard right okay yeah. i'll watch naomi watts masturbate i'm into that okay but that's my one answer damien okay so it was one, it was one answer so that was one so the david, lynch. david lynch he crammed 10 answers no it's just one answer it's one answer how are you buying this are you guys fucking with me <laughs> I did, no apparently your dad's fucking with you <laughs> <laughs> all right guys confusional arousal is more commonly referred to as sleep drunkenness it occurs when you wake up and sort of fumble through life making absurd decisions, you know, like you answer your telephone when the alarm is going off or having a conversation with someone you have no recollection of. Or like last weekend when Damien woke up and pissed all over my floor. Oh, no, wait, wait. That's just regular drunkenness. That's non-confusional arousal. <laughs> <laughs> I was just tired. I didn't even drink that night. It's a long way to the bathroom. God damn it. Confusional arousal has been a hotter topic as of late because it's received less attention than sleepwalking, but can have severe, if not dangerous, consequences. In order to understand when these episodes occur and what might be happening, scientists at Stanford interviewed about 20,000 people on their sleep habits and whether they had experienced symptoms of the disorder. They were also asked about mental health diagnoses and any medication they might be on. A total of 15% of people had experienced at least one episode in the past year. 8% had complete or partial amnesia of the episode, and 14% of those who had episodes also experienced night wandering. So, Jackie, to, to clarify, this is different from just being tired after you get up or being groggy or not having all your senses about you. This is a time that you can have a loss of memory. Yeah. This is a time when you're acting in ways that are not consistent with your personality or consciousness. Right, or even just, yeah, even just a simple task that even in, your, in a tired state you could do. Interestingly, 84% of the people that said they had experienced some kind of episode were also diagnosed with sleep slash mental disorders or were on psychotropic drugs. The most common mental disorders that were associated with confusional arousal were bipolar disorder and panic disorder. And the most common drugs associated with confusional arousal were antidepressants, which mm. you prescribe to people with bipolar disorder and panic disorder. That makes sense. Damien, I think you have this because I have woken you up when you are in, in a, a state of extreme tiredness and you are you are like a drunk person. Yeah. You are like you. I think you of all people have. Oh, this. I'm way yeah. surlier than a drunk person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, like when the scientists reviewed the data and removed all possible known causes, like what we were just talking about, they found that only 0.9 percent of people surveyed experience confusional arousal just by chance or just have that symptom. So it's it's pretty much causal. Well, they yeah. expect that it's causal by by these mental disorders. Or you know what? I have people who like to party. Yeah, I actually have something that I like to call confusional arousal arousal. Uh -huh. Which is that I will start fucking my girlfriend in my sleep. Like yeah. I will, like she will tell me, like you, you just rubbed up against me all night, and then eventually just start, and and I have no recollection. Yeah, now, I will wake up halfway in the middle of it. And here's what scares the shit out of me. When we travel, frequently Damien and I share a bed. And I'm not sure if Sleep Bobby knows the difference. Yeah. yeah I call Bobby. Yeah. Bobby's, my, Bobby's my roommate. Bobby's my roommate tonight. Come on. You can come. have him. Recently, Damien and I actually just went down to Cabo San Lucas before the hurricane for Jackie's fiance's bachelor party. Yeah. And we shared a room. We didn't share a bed this time, though we normally do. And on the way down there, I was literally thinking, because I was assuming we would share a bed, uh, hope I don't fuck Damien in my sleep. <laughs> 
but you brought the condoms just in yeah. case, and that's, that's why I is. sleep with the condom on just in case. If I'm going to do it, it's going to be protected. Jackie, what was your decision? Who do you think took that one? I actually think Damien took that one. Damien had a good answer. He I like that. A good answer. I like that he didn't complain cheating. so much. You know, yeah, it was, I didn't, it was I, a nice I, change I'm of glad, pace. I'm glad you did it without cheating, as I have done every single time. Mm-hmm. For those of you who would like to continue to hear me do this without cheating, tune in next week for Science Faction 38, where we'll have some first-hand research on just how painful ball kicking can be. Let her rip. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right. 